Welcome to the sixth episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. In this episode, we're going to talk to Benjamin Carenza about the Open Photo Project and have command line love. Plus, Ooh. we'll go over your feedback. If you're listening live, hello. You can send us messages using the chat facility on our website and in the IRC channel. I'm Alan, and joining me is Mark. Hello. And Tony. Hi there. We've got uh, no Laura this week. Gosh, she's been gone a long time. She, she hasn't made it back yet uh, from wherever it is she's been away at. I'm starting to think we should send her some sort of search party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably wise. So, uh, Mark, what have you been up to this week? Um, I have been setting up my Nexus 7 so that it will dual boot Android and Ubuntu. Oh, that's quite cool. It and is quite that? cool. Um, well, Ubuntu is a developer preview and Android is still Android with all my data on it. To, which is right. nice so did you have to unlock it to do that yes okay so i did have to back up my data unlock it restore my data how did you back up your data before you i used a honky collection of scripts on windows <laughs> okay sorry there's yeah there's there's loads and loads of tools for for doing um backups, backups over um adb on windows but no one seems to have made a nice one for linux yet oh, right. which is a real pain in the and that's Nexus. and that's even before you've uh, rooted it. You can use those tools to do that. Yes. Oh, okay. I thought all the tools that required uh, want, that you could use to back up required you to root it first, which kind of, kind of like chicken and egg. Because no, as soon you, as have you, root to, it, you have to you have to you have to enable USB debugging. Oh, okay. And then it does it over that. Oh, and brilliant. then you unlock it, which wipes all of your user data, mm -hmm. um, and then you can restore it and root it. Um, but the the clever bit is installing a um, a custom recovery system, which you'd normally do if you were flashing a mm -hmm. um, a custom Android ROM, and then you can install something called Multi ROM, which is essentially the um, a bootloader. Right. So it'll load load the Android kernel. Then instead of loading the in its system for Android, it'll load Multi ROM, which then either lets you carry on booting Android or select a different. Uh, ROM which you've installed, which can be Ubuntu or another Android ROM or Tizen or whatever runs you, on the device. How do you update the um, the Ubuntu install? Because if you if you run our Fablet Flash, it'll wipe it. Yeah, you you have to you have to manually um, so you you manually download the Ubuntu ROM um, and put it on um, your SD card or whatever. Right. Um, in the next seven, you just copy it onto the internal store the internal right. um, fake SD card. Right. And then you select it in the um, in the the custom recovery and say add it to the right okay. uh, add it to the boot menu. Have you have you written this up somewhere? Yes, it's on my blog. Oh, well, awesome. We'll my link blog, to that. yeah. It, I basically just followed two tutorials, so my blog post just sticks them together. Really brilliant, awesome. Alan BaronFrozenWasteland dot com. Tony, have you done anything uh, at all? I've been playing with the Ubuntu SDK. Oh yeah, Ooh. how's that? Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What does it do? Uh, for developing QML apps for oh, the phone for the and phone. The tablet, yeah, using Qt Creator, uh, I've been written? testing it a lot. Uh, not a lot yet, you know, hello world, that kind of thing. <laughs> but uh, big plans, big plans. I'm sure. <laughs> how about brimming over with ideas? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how about you, Tony? Done any photography recently? Yeah, actually, I was just recently at a photography farm <laughs> where they we, grow photographers. Yeah, that's right. Yes, we. Dig them up Organic from the ground. Ones. It's a very nice posh farm where you go and stay for three days and and do some photography and have some lovely food. And I took along a box of wine and uh, had a really good time a and box of wine. learn about the business of photography and things. Awesome. It was uh, challenging, but uh, uh, you know, very worthwhile. Is it like instructional course kind of? Yeah, thing? it's run by a very well-known, award-winning wedding photographer in the country called Lisa Devlin. Right, um, and it's a nice small group of people, and you kind of get lots of. Uh, you know, kind of one-to-one -one tuition and things. So really good, yeah. Nice. But uh, I'm very pleased to be here. <laughs> and wouldn't rather be on a farm drinking wine at all. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Let's get on with the show. is Benjamin Carenza from the Open Photo Project. How are you doing, Benjamin? I'm doing good. How are you? Yeah, we're well, not too bad. Thank you. So tell us about the Open Photo Project. What's it all about? So um, the Open Photo Project is a open source project that was started by Jason Mathay back in uh, 2011. It started as a Kickstarter project, 
um, with the idea that users should be able to control where their photos, tags, and other data are stored instead of using third-party services such as Flickr and Picasa Web, which limit control um, as to where users can you know, store that data. Oh, that sounds awesome. I've, I'm one of the people who've never heard of this and I don't know anything about it, so I will be asking the dumb questions. Um, so the first, the first question is, I've used Gallery, which is a, like a PHP web hosting thing on my own VPS. Is it like that or is it different from that? So uh, I, I'm a former user of Gallery and I think, um, you know, I think that uh, Open Photo is more of the, uh, it's like an evolution of Gallery. It has all the features you would expect in, say, uh, Flickr or Picasa, um, you know, but it is open source in the nature that uh, Gallery is. In fact, we're, we're actually aiming to have support to import um, photos and data um, directly from Gallery. Cool. So, so I could take uh, the Open Photo project, grab the code from GitHub, put it on my own server at home, for example, and then my family could all upload their photos from their digital cameras, because we've all got a camera or phones or whatever, and then store it all centrally and not have to worry about some third-party service shutting down. Is that basically the premise? That, that, that's the idea. And also the fact that you can, you know, you don't only have to uh, choose to do it on your VPS, but you could store your data. Um, you can host the, the platform itself on a VPS or even shared hosting, which is much more affordable for most folks. And then use a free service uh, like a free account with Dropbox or Box.net to actually store your photos or even Amazon S3. So you mentioned it, it started with a Kickstarter campaign. How did, how did that all work out? Did they get their, their goal and, and uh, did they get, uh, what, what were they asking for and, and how did that work out? Um, I think the original amount was $25,000, and they did reach that goal. Um, you know, it was a successful Kickstarter campaign, um, and that was the initial seed money that they used to start it. Um, Jai Sun was a former uh, Yahoo employee, um, so he uh, left his day job there to actually work on Open Photo full-time. Um, and there's a lineup of, of contributors, you know, core contributors who also, you know, spend a lot of their time but also work at great companies. Um, you know, Gareth Greenaway is pretty notable in the open source community and he works on like some of our cloud stuff for Amazon. So um what um after the the Kickstarter funding had been sort of gathered and spent, what point was the project at then or is it is that still ongoing? Um so the project's still on uh the project's still going. I think that money's spent. I don't know the exact financials behind that, but I do know that the Shuttleworth Foundation um stepped in and uh gave a scholarship to Jason mm. and uh one of the other contributors to allow them to work on the project full time. Cool. Cool. So why did you choose to get involved in this project in the first place? What appealed to you about it? Um so I've been on uh Mozilla's web forward team. It's a uh open innovation program to uh, try to help kickstart uh, open source projects. And, and Open Photo was one of our first uh, candidate projects that came through. And I, I really felt like they were going to you know, need a hand in, in uh, kind of managing their community. So um, I, I was involved you know, as a web forward member, um, you know, just kind of trying to market that, that service at the time and decided to stay on and, and volunteer as a community manager. So what does a community manager for Open Photo do? Um, so, um, basically I, I, I help promote, um, and advocate for the use of open photo, um, here in the United States, um, that's promoting it at, at different events. Um, you know, for instance, next month I'm going to be promoting, um, you know, open photo in addition to other web forward initiatives, um, at Linux Fest Northwest. Um, but also, you know, helping users on IRC, um, you know, trying to, um, strike partnerships with hosting companies such as DreamHost, which we have a partnership with, and AppFog here in Portland, and uh, just trying to grow the community and uh, grow developers and get more people involved. So as a, a user of um, cameras and, and, uh, and phones that generate lots of, lots of images, how, what's, the, what's the use case? How would, how would I probably use this to replace something like, I don't know, Shotwell or iPhoto or something like that? Um, so right now we don't have desktop integration. We're hoping to either have some kind of a desktop app in the future that's on our wish list, or also we're hoping to have at some point a Shotwell uh, plugin that will allow them to, you know, Shotwell 
users to uh, upload their photos directly in Open Photo. Um, right now, you can use the web um, uploader, or you can also use an Android or iPhone. Um, we have an app for both. So I so I can I can uh, upload uh, all of my photos. Uh, just like throw them all at an installation of Open Photo, and then once they're in there, I can start moving them around to folders. What what kind of management tools does it have within there, other than just you know storing your photos? Um, right now, we're using, we have a tag system to uh, manage manage photos and label them. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's also going to the management as as to how you can organize your photos is rapidly expanding. We have a number of wish list items that we're working on to to give uh, users more control cool. and also more places to store data. Um, one of the things that we're going to be announcing either tomorrow or the next day, but you guys will hear about now, is we're going to allow people to store photos on archive.org. Oh, Ooh. really? That's yeah. quite cool. Yes. And also, um, I forgot to mention, we do support uh, storage on uh, DreamHost Dream Objects, which is a new service that they just launched uh, a few months ago. Mm -hmm. So in theory, I could have a very small VPS um, that's got a web server and, and um, open photo installed on it, but point it to some other third-party service which might have um, cheaper bandwidth or cheaper storage um, mm. and, and have all my photos go over there. That's exactly the idea. Right. That's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah. I like that. So um, how does it handle if... So if I've got some photos, um, or say if Alan and his family have all got their photos on there and they want to send, say, an album to some friends but not have to publish it to the world, does it support that? Is there some sort of privacy and access control um, that it supports so that you can share things with other people? There's, there's um, just like other services, you can have private photos... Um, and, and choose to share them with uh, people privately and have a private link and cool. uh, password protect them as well. Um, and just uh, also, if, if you you have friends and family that use other more popular services and they want to make the leap to open photo, uh, we do have support for importing photos from Flickr, Instagram, and Facebook right now. Cool. So why was it important that this project was an open source project? Because I mean, the nature the nature of the project is to give control and um, choice to the user. And I mean, you know, open source projects that's that's generally what they're about is to allow people to have control over over the software that they use. And this is, you know, it's just kind of the nature of the project is to be open, you know, and let users decide. And have you had? Uh, has there been a lot of success in growing? The community, obviously, I hope from your point of view there is because you've been managing the community. <laughs> but yeah, um, has there been success in, in getting um, beyond the sort of core team contributions from the community? Um, we have a we have regular uh, contributors who come in, um, the core folks, and then we do also have people who uh, you know just come in and submit a patch and mm -hmm. and uh, you know whether it's to our documentation or just the the, the PHP uh, source code base that we have. And, uh, you know, we may never see them again, and we then have new people that come in. So we have a regular flow of contributors and a lot of people that are, you know, new every day that are interested in the project. That's cool. Are you looking for people with specific skill sets at the moment? Um, we can always use people who can hack on PHP um, since it is a web project. Um, I, I don't know as, as far as the other. We do have some sub-projects, like we have a WordPress plugin that looks like it's a little outdated that could use some uh use some work we're always we're still looking to get a charm um for for ubuntu server developed um so so there's a number of ways you can uh contribute um the main one being contributing some uh some work to uh the existing project um and or one of the sub projects i noticed that both not not just the the core of the project which it looks like it's been branded trove box is that right um so that's the that's the hosted service, um, which ah. is, you know, yeah, so that's kind of an idea is if you don't want to manage it yourself, we do have a hosted service in that you can, you know, let um, Jason and his, his folks go ahead and take over, you know, and, and host everything for you. Right, but it's the same code base that's used on Trovebox as I would get if I checked out GitHub and put it on my VPS. Correct. Cool. And I, no I noticed while well, I was just uh, browsing the GitHub repository, and uh, I noticed the uh, mobile apps for iOS and Android are open source as well on uh, on GitHub, which is nice. So if people mm, want to contribute, cool. not just to the, the core app, but the mobile apps as well, there's uh, there's an opportunity there as well. 
Yes, and we and we also do have if for those people who are interested in Python, we do have a um, open photo Python uh, OAuth client, and uh, you know there's there's a lot of different things that you can work on. Um, it looks like they've ad they're actually already working on an iPhoto plugin now that I look down a little bit. Oh, cool. So, what can you do with the Android and iPhone clients at the moment? The apps. Um, you can you can take well you can take photos and upload them directly to your uh, open photo. Uh, um, either your 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 self hosted or the uh, hosted service. Okay, and so can you do any funky processing? Make it look like it's a vintage photograph, <laughs> like Instagram, or, or does that not uh, cover that feature set? I, I don't think we're totally there yet, but um, that's probably going to be on the roadmap as well. Cool. So if I go to the Open Photo website uh, and download the code, what do I need to have to run Open Photo today? Um. So we support Ubuntu. Um, you basic the basic most common setup is going to be Ubuntu with Apache. Um, you'll need uh, MySQL um, and PHP. So a lot like Gallery, in fact. Yep. Cool. So a fairly common set of yeah. requirements, really. Yeah. Most hosting yeah, providers just, are going to provide that. Yeah, just some of the just some of the base dependencies. You're going to need uh, PHP pair and curl and mcrypt and you know just some basic PHP dependencies. Mm -hmm. I noticed from the uh, the website on the community section, there's a discussion and feature requests, so people can uh, request whatever new features they want to be implemented, and uh, they're using a, um, a voting system. Uh, is that uh, I know Ubuntu used um, a similar system for voting for features and, and bug fixes and stuff. Is this is this stuff actually used as a basis for what features will be developed next, or is it is it just a kind of wish list of things that would be nice to have in the future? Um, so right now it's a wish list for uh, nice things to have in the future. Um, what we do is we look at that list and then we import them into GitHub and create issues. Mm -hmm. And then um, we flag them as far as, you know, what we feel is the priority level and then try to uh, get to them, you know, kind of as, as our roadmap uh, can you, continues to develop out. Right. So is the, the developers that work on this who are paid developers either through um, Kickstarter or charitable donations or, or through um, Trovebox, which I assume is a, a paid-for service, um, are they focused on developing uh, applications uh, or developing updates specifically for Trovebox or is it for, you know, for the whole project? It's for the entire project because it's the same shared code base. Cool. So what's coming up for Open Photo in the future? Um, so as I, as I had mentioned, we are adding um, support for archive.org. It should actually already be in the repo, um, which will be announced in the next day or so. Um, and then we have a number of uh, different features we're working on in the front end. And uh, let me just go and list a few of those for you guys. Um, some of the things that we're working on is uh, Shotwell, a Shotwell plugin. Okay. Um, we're still trying to get support for AppFog, um, which had previously been PHP Fog, so um, that's still in the works right now. What does that do? Sorry. Um, so AppFog is a company based here in Portland, and they're a platform as a service provider, mm -hmm. and we're uh, we're trying to get support for them. They're one of the hosting providers we're working to uh, have uh, you know one click support for. Ah, I see. So there's, we've we've talked about support for Shotwell and mobile clients, and hopefully in the future Ubuntu Phone. Of course, <laughs> I you thought that that yeah, might come up. You saw that coming. Um, <laughs> how about um, for other platforms? For so, for example, um, someone who's using iOS or using Windows, will there be uh, clients that can connect in from there as well? Well, we we do actually have an iOS client. Um, right Sorry, now. I didn't mean iOS. I meant OS ten. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't see that at the top of our list right now. Um, right. We do have the iPhoto I importing. Isn't iPhoto a, a Mac OS X it app? It is, or no? yeah. So okay. if you've got your photos in iPhoto, then you're yes, laughing, you really. do it. you could do it that way. Awesome. Um, but I don't know if – I don't think we're actually going to be developing a native app for um, for the des uh, Mac OS X desktop at this time. Right. Cool. Okay. So where can people find out more if they'd like to find out about Open Photo? Uh, they can go to theopenphotoproject.org and then just uh, uh, go ahead and click on the community section. There should be a, an email address at the bottom called uh, hello at openphoto.me, and they can email us and uh, we'll give them instructions on how to get started, or they can also just fork the repo and, and uh, submit a patch. Cool. Excellent. Awesome. 
Well, I hope you have some new engagement after to, talking to us this evening. We certainly have a new user. I'm going to be putting this on my, my <laughs> home server straight away. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to us this evening, Benjamin. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Very right, much. Cheers. Bye. 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 And now it's time for some command line love. Yay. The return of. And this week's command line love is Geek Note. What, what is that? Uh, well, if you have used Evernote. I have used Evernote. And you have an account which hasn't been hacked. I do not. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Um, basically, it's... Uh, well, so, for those listeners who don't know what Evernote is, Evernote is a basically a cloud service for storing notes... Um, sort of like tomboy, right? With a sync in the background because. But you can do rich text, can't you? you yeah, can you can do all sorts of stuff. stuff. And if you pay for their premium service, you can do pretty much any kind of media. Um, Geeknote le- uh, is a command line client for Evernote, so you connect it to your Evernote account, and you say Geeknote edit name of your note, and it'll give you in your chosen text editor a markdown version of your Evernote note, which you can then edit. And save back to your Evernote account, where it will sync with your other uh, your other Evernote apps. Huh. So, do you have to do anything other than use your editor and quit? No, save, save and quit, no. and it automatically syncs it up yes. to the cloud. And you can also create new notes in Markdown, which will get and they get converted to HTML when they're viewed in your other devices. What do you mean by Markdown? Ah, Markdown is a. Um, sort of lightweight markup language so rather than having to put tags around everything to show it's a heading or something like that it's more like um uh like wiki, wiki syntax right. so you okay. you know you say but it's so the idea is that it's supposed to be sort of human readable you you should be able to look at it and get a feeling for what it, what the the symbols mean so you put like if you want to put emphasis on something you put asterisks asterisks either side of it if you want to underline something you put an underscore either side of it right. um, if you want a heading you underline it uh, with um sort of dashes and then yeah it'll convert that to an html heading when it renders it or you can convert it to other formats as well so and, what sorry alan why have you found this useful um partly because it means i can edit my evernote notes in vim and so why have you found it useful? <laughs> hey. Ooh. And secondly, because um, I like marking stuff up with Markdown because it's a lot. There's a lot less to type than. Uh, and so you, you use Evernote to store like you know whatever notes. Yeah. Is that encrypted somewhere? It, how how safe is it? <laughs> um, well, it's password protected, but they recently had a security breach and reset everybody's password so i i don't know the thing is because it's not stored in your own server this is unfortunately this is the one thing i've not managed to find something which i can store on my own server yet um right so i compromised and went with evernote so i think i'm going to add a command line love for what i do for, to solve this solution for next time okay then mm. we'll, we'll look forward to hearing about that on the next show after next <laughs> Yes. And it's time for your feedback. Uh, Stephen Rosenberg wrote in from Los Angeles to say, The podcast has been going very well this season. I like the shorter, more frequent episodes. News and discussion is more timely, and everyone's nervousness over the time constraints <laughs> seems to make them sound peppier than usual. Or you could all be drunk. I'm in the States, and I wouldn't know one way or the other. I'm drunk right now. In all seriousness, I enjoyed the interview with Elizabeth Crombach on Zubuntu. It's a pity you aren't getting her back, as she's sort of in the middle of the whole Ubuntu community controversy. Keep up the good work, more interviews, and more quote-unquote cake. I assure you it's real cake. Yeah, real cake, real tea. It's as strong as it gets on this show. <laughs> but there's nothing to say we couldn't have Elizabeth back on the show. Yeah, uh, it's not a one-time offer. Yeah. <laughs> she is welcome back. You've been on once and once only. Exactly. Never come back. Yeah, no, Elizabeth, it was a great interview. And lots of people seem to have enjoyed that one, so that's mm. good. Um, Nick Clark emailed in with this request. 
I would really appreciate it if you could pass on any recommendations of a laptop that is available now that can be seen as especially suitable for an Ubuntu install. Nothing too exotic or expensive, but one that offers rock-solid performance would be ideal, if that's no trouble to ask. Love the show. Keep up the great work. There's a wiki somewhere, isn't there, with a list of... Uh... There's a hardware compatibility database. Yeah, and that Ubuntu, sounds like a Ubuntu usable... friendly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I personally have um, a ThinkPad, a penchant for ThinkPads, and yeah. uh, they tend to work quite well, and they're not exotic. Unfortunately, they are quite expensive. Mm. Um, yeah, we've got one at work, which you know is very good, mm. but yeah, not so cheap. And my my the other laptop I bought recently is a an Asus ZenBook, which again works very well, but is not cheap. Does mm. uh, Dell only do the developer laptop officially at the moment, or do they have other ranges available? I think there may be others, depending upon what region you're in. Yeah, okay. Maybe if you find out what they sell to all the, the people in China, <laughs> and then buy the equivalent model over here... That's a cunning plan. ...then Ubuntu yeah. would work on it. Well, I think, actually, Ubuntu is certified on every model of oh, well, Dell there you laptop. Go. Buy a Dell laptop. It's just, it's just whether they um, choose to sell it or not in that region. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they're all certified. Right. But so I there's, a, there's a fairly fairly good chance that something by Dell would yeah, be a good I mean, way to go. For me personally, my 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 uh top two uh laptops are ThinkPad and um MacBook Pro or MacBook Air, but but they're both fall on the expensive side. Mm. So the next I would choose after that would probably be actually a Dell Latitude. Right. Because they're quite robust, they're quite, you know, um they're decent performance. They're good machines. Cool. Well, some ideas for you there, Nick. Cool. Hopefully that's of use. And Philippe or Felipe left a comment on the website. One thing that hasn't been discussed about Mir and Wayland is some of the non-technical aspects. Mir has a single stakeholder, GPL version 3 with contribution license agreement, and was developed behind closed doors for nine months. Wayland has many stakeholders, is MIT licensed, and has been developed in the open from the start. These characteristics by themselves are enough for companies and communities to reject Mir. Uh, yeah, maybe. I, I think the, the problem or the, the, the fundamental thing here is that Canonical don't care if other people use Mir or not. They're going to use Mir. Um, I'm also not entirely convinced about the whole it's GPL v3, therefore that's a problem. Uh, because the whole point of it being contributor license agreement under that code means that potentially we could relicense it under some other um uh, under some other license yes but no th- his point is that that license could be a proprietary license it could be or it could I'm, be a more I'm, per- I'm, permissive sorry, license. i'm, I'm uh, you're presuming i'm presuming that that, that would be his concern yes. or that or that it might be the concern of a company who wants to get involved that because the contribution is to canonical rather than to say the apache software foundation mm-hmm. that therefore it's canonical who makes the decision about whether it gets relicensed under a more restrictive sure. or more permissive license Yes, I have heard this argument a few times. Yeah. <laughs> mm, good thoughts. Dave Jeffrey also stopped by the website to say, Thanks again for another interesting episode. Like Alan, oh no, like Alan, I found, <laughs> <laughs> I found Pulse Audio to be almost completely transparent for a few years now. The only place I've noticed Pulse Audio still causes problems is if you want to run Jack, the professional grade audio toolkit. I have to issue a kill pulse audio com- from the command line to get Jack to start, which seems, seems a bit aggressive, really. By the way, please don't change the theme, theme music. It's perfect. So after I said I don't have any problems with uh, pulse audio last time, um, Uh-oh. this week I filed a bug in pulse audio <laughs> <laughs> because on my desktop it just respawns constantly Ooh. in uh, in raring. I don't, I'm not quite sure what's going on there, okay. but it's broken. Yeah. Do we use Jack when we're recording? We do. Do we also have Pulse Audio running? Uh, yeah, it's an Ubuntu laptop. We haven't disabled it. Right. So they seem to sit well together on on yeah. your particular setup. On my particular setup, yeah. Mm. Pulse Audio seems to get out of the way and Jack takes over and then Pulse kicks yeah. in afterwards. A man called Mark sent in this plea. Any chance of sharing that much discussed mutt config? Smiley face. Much discussed by Alan. Um, yeah, all right. <laughs> this is this is Alan's MUT configuration, isn't yes, it? Yes, this is the MUT configuration that I have on my laptop so that I can um, access my email in a console um, and rather than using Thunderbird because at the time 
if you remember, I explained yes. my Thunderbird yep. was bulky and slow. Uh, so I wanted a way of using MUT because I actually used to use MUT a long time ago. And I found myself very efficient with email using uh, using MUT. Um, the config that I'm using is actually just uh, mostly from Googling and saying, you know, how do I set colors in MUT? Oh, look, there's a bit of config. Mash that into my MUT <laughs> config file. And then, uh, you know, how do I access IMAP in MUT? Oh, look, there's another bit of config. Mash that in. So my config file is just a mishmash of other people's config that people have put in blog posts. I'll happily create yet another blog post with a screenshot of my MUT mm. uh, setup uh, when I can point it at a folder that doesn't mm. contain anything that you probably wouldn't be allowed to see. Um, but, <laughs> you know, that, um, yeah, happy to do that. But, um, cool. yeah. Chris, email to ask. Will you cover GIMP in GUI Love? In all seriousness, though, I love GUI Love. It is important to encourage the, an environment that is open to all and not just the technical savvy. Keep up the good work. Yeah, although, what do we have in the last uh, GUI Love? It was uh, X-Tile, which was slightly geeky. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, if you have any suggestions for either GUI Love or Command Line Love, do let us know. Either tweet us or contact us via Various Tony means. will tell you all the things in yeah. between the segments. I'm I sure will. he yes. speaks yes. very quickly. <laughs> Alistair Grant also put fingers to keyboard to tell us. I, are we running out of metaphors for getting in touch? <laughs> I discovered your last. Uh, I discovered your show only last year, but have been an avid listener ever since. During series season. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> the way that sounds. <laughs> I discovered your show, but have been an avid listener, even though. <laughs> 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 Even though I actually still listen. Carry on. During season six, episode four, you read a letter with the listener complaining their Skype was disor- dis- distorted and you mentioned disabling Skype's auto level control. I had a similar issue that wasn't simply the sound levels. The notifications were distorted regardless of how low the volume was. This happens to me sometimes when I boot my desktop. Interesting. I resolved it by, uh, on my MacBook Air by running Ubuntu 13.04 by following the solution from Ask Ubuntu, which we'll link to in the show notes. P.S. Don't change your theme music. P.P.S. Congratulations to Canonical. I've been running 13.04 since early March and have only had one issue with Chrome crashing on startup. Oh, that's really good. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And Alistair is listening in the IRC channel live and says that we're mangling his email. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Mark is, yes. It's nearly the end of the show. Guilty as charged. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If there's something you think we should talk about or someone we should talk to, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And remember, if we don't hear from you, we might not have enough content. And that can only mean one thing, more quizzes. Thanks for listening. Uh, join us on Wednesday, the 10th of April at 19.30 UTC for our next episode. Uh, 7.30 that's, p.m. What? 7.30 p.m. Yes. That's uh, not 7.30 p.m. actually, Mark. Uh, 19.30 UTC, which is 20.30 BST. So for us in the UK, it's, it's 8.30 Because the clocks are changing. Yes. Well, so the countdown on our website will still tell you when the next live show is. Okay. Join us then. Good luck, everybody. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. Goodbye.